Coming up next in this week, computer hardware, baby tech sucks. Radeon R9 280, Western Digital's MyCloud EX2, low power PCs, Chromebooks, and more. It's all coming up next on Twitch. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twitch. Bandwidth for Twitch is provided by Cashfly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This is Twitch This Week in Computer Hardware, episode 257, recorded March 6th, 2014. Baby Tech Sucks. Welcome to Twitch This Week in Computer Hardware, Twitch weekly show that aims to bring you some computer news, mostly about PC hardware and gaming, and it's all very low-key. We answer some questions. I've been asked to not build up the podcast in the opening by my partner in crime, Mr. Ryan Shrout, who may or may not be excited about something and is probably currently located in Kentucky. Yes. <laughs> you wanted a, yes, you wanted a low key, no build up introduction, so you you wouldn't have to meet any expectations or heightened expectations of the Twitch audience. Was that low key enough for you, Ryan? Yeah, I think I think that's acceptable. Uh, we'll tweak it a little bit between now and next Thursday, but I think that's I think that gets a, the point across, right? That we are just a hardware show, and thus not that's what the we'll best talk hardware about. show, not a great hardware show, not a particularly informative or useful hardware show but just a hardware show. I don't think it's right for us to comment on the quality of the show as the creators. I think it's up to the audience to, to really quantify that quality and let us know in email form perhaps or on Are Twitter you for or whatever it is. Box quotes from the audience that we can then label the show yes. with? This is exciting. Yes, exactly. you, there's some sort of meta lit critic kind of English majory thing going on with you this week, and it's exciting. <laughs> I hope not. When Lord, no. <laughs> Ryan slowly turned into a lit major. It's time now that you've got now that you've got Alan moving to Kentucky. It's time for you to move to Northern California. Pursue your inter. Your oh, I'm not even going there. The idea of you living nope. in NorCal is really funny. <laughs> GTX 750Ti. Do you want to win one? This is the miraculous $150 gaming card that kicks ass if you've got a low end box and you want to be able to do things like play Titanfall or play any video games. If you missed last week's show and it was a pile of awesome. Sorry, it was uh, reasonably acceptable, and it did discuss hardware, including the 750 GT, uh, Ti. But one of the things that, that they did up at PC Perm recently is they took some $350 to $500 inexpensive desktop boxes from a big box store, a.k.a. Best Buy, and they threw this GTX 750 Ti inside of them. And lo and behold, mystically and magically, they were made over into gaming boxes. Not the best gaming boxes, not the most amazing gaming boxes, but certainly acceptable gaming machines. You can now win a G4. GTX 750 Ti by showing off your upgrade worthy rig. What are the fine detail-y points that people need to follow if they want to win this glorious, glorious $150 Maxwell based GPU? So we've got five of them to give away and the intent is to give them to people that, uh, you know, don't have like a GTX 770 or an R9 280X or something like, like that already, right? The intent is to kind of find five people that have systems similar to what we used, uh, at least similar in idea, and then give that to, to those people that can really, you know, change the way they view PC gaming. Um, so what we're asking is that you take a picture of your machine. The inside of your machine would be preferable. Uh, you upload it to Imager, submit it in a form. Also take screenshots of CPU-Z and GPU-Z. Include that in the form on our website. Uh, you can find If you go to PCPer.com, you'll find the news post that talks about the, uh, the contest and giveaway. Um, now, of course, this is the internet. And I do not believe that we will have 100% honesty in the submissions, I guess is what I'm saying. And there's nothing in reality, there's no way for me to check if the thing you take pictures of or screenshots of is your mom's computer or your sister's computer instead of yours. I wouldn't know that. So, uh, hey, whatever. So put in your submissions. Uh, we're going to draw on March 13th. So a week from today, we will have uh, five winners of these video cards. So... That's it. Just Ooh. a quick little plug if you want to try to win something for free. And I would like to, but I recently invalidated myself from the competition outside of being an associate of PC Per by actually buying a proper GPU. Nice. 
Oh, my goodness. I am looking forward to you coming out to California for uh, GDC, the Game Developers Conference. And I'm also really excited to hear what you find out from Microsoft, who, along with AMD, Intel, NVIDIA, and Qualcomm, will announce DirectX 12 at GDC 2014. Last week, we thought that DirectX 12 was going to be some sort of mantle killer that Microsoft, who apparently was not going to touch DirectX 11, had suddenly come out of the woodwork going, no, 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 no. We're not going to let AMD control the relationship to the GPU at a low level. We're going to create DirectX 12 to take care of that. Um, but March 20th, 10 a.m., a couple days into the 2014 uh, uh, Game Developers Conference in beautiful San Francisco, California, um, I thought that was interesting. AMD, Intel, NVIDIA, and Qualcomm all together... Happily so. Probably <laughs> a lot of hugging and kissing is going to be involved. It is San Francisco. Oh, sure. um, yeah. There's going to be a lot of love on that stage. Or is this just one of those things where Microsoft basically just started knocking heads together and said, everybody come here and play nice if you ever want to sell a freaking GPU again? <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, Microsoft definitely still has all the power in this relationship, right? So uh, even though AMD has Mantle, if, if direct, if, if, DirectX 12 is what we think it will be, and it implements a lot of these low-level hardware, um, uh, less software overhead kind of implementations. Um, then, you know, NVIDIA will be supporting it, Intel will be supporting it, and Qualcomm, which is interesting we'll talk about, will be supporting it. AMD will obviously have to. Um, mm -hmm. This is... The, the battles between these major GPU companies when it comes to DirectX are mostly about feature set implementations, right? So, um, you know, in DirectX revisions in the past, you'd have, you know, in, NVIDIA fighting for one particular way to implement a feature, AMD fighting for a different one, because each kind of lends itself to its hardware that it's working on a little bit better, right? And so sometimes right. you get it one way, sometimes you get it the other way. And it's kind of up to Microsoft as the independent third party in this relationship to say, we're going to pick the best one for developers or consumers or whatever and, mm -hmm. and go down that road. And I, and I imagine that will be the case here. AMD will definitely support DirectX 12. All, all these guys will support DirectX 12. It's just a matter of, what it actually turns out to be. The inclusion of the Qualcomm logo is the most interesting part about this, this screenshot. You know, AMD and NVIDIA, you assume. Intel, yes, as well, right? They still make desktop graphics. Um, uh, you but know, they that? make very important oh. ones. Um, but Qualcomm Snapdragon is interesting, right? Because it's, um, it's a, obviously it's a, a typically a mobile graphics component that they're making, right? So they've got the uh, Adreno graphics technologies and that, that they have custom built. But it's interesting because they're not the only mobile GPU company, right? You've dun, got dun, dun. several other Power VR uh, right. from Imagination, those guys that, that are making it, but yet their logos aren't on here. So I'm curious to see what that means if this is just like these are the first four people that signed up and Qualcomm has the biggest, uh, you know, the most development resources. So they were the first to kind of build up to having presentable DX12 based technology or something like that. It's it, That's probably more, more than likely the case. Uh, but it also means Microsoft has not given up on the mobile side of things. It also maybe indicates that Windows RT is not dead because they are working on technologies with it. You know, NVIDIA is here for GeForce and likely for Tegra, right? So I imagine that Tegra will support DX12 at some at some level. And then it'll be up to Intel to figure out what they do with their HD graphics. Um, you know, Bay Trail, if, we go, if we're looking at low power stuff, supports DX11-ish. And mm -hmm. if they also use PowerVR in um, like the new Merrifield and Moorefield chips that were announced at Mobile World Congress. So uh, it'll, be, it'll be very curious to see DirectX 12 Will this be a, we are uh, developing low-level API, closer to the hardware, low overhead for high-performance desktop GPU graphics, or is DX12A, this is our play into the ultra-low power, uh, maybe competing against OpenGL ES or something like that, right? So now it's kind of interesting because it's possible that it's, not a play for high-end graphics, but maybe it's a play for low-end graphics, low-power graphics, right? So, um, but I think it will be some of both is what I'm mm -hmm. guessing, right? So I know NVIDIA is excited about what DX12 is going to be. 
So that usually would mean high end uh, from the people that I talk to and then Qualcomm's on there. So it obviously means something for low power as well. It's going to be interesting to see what that turns into. Uh, you know, and I'm, it, it's, it's, we wait with bated breath to see if this is going to be the beginning of the end of Mantle or if Mantle is going to continue on its merry way. I think Mantle will continue on. Or do you think, do you think Microsoft's going to try to subsume it? Um, no, I mean, they're honestly, they're not really threatened by it. Like Microsoft, right. Microsoft is much more threatened by OpenGL uh, and OpenGL ES than it would be by Mantle. Right. Sure. OpenGL is taken over on PS4. It's taking over on Android. Um, those are the, that's the dominant, you know, and iOS is using OpenGL as well. So it, it needs to kind of stave that off. Mantle, it's not really worried about. Mantle can continue to exist as long as AMD is willing to develop it. And as long as game developers are willing to utilize it, that will be the real question. Um, AMD claims that they have some stuff, some really, really interesting stuff to show us at GDC about Mantle. Mm -hmm. So we'll see, right? You know, we'll, we'll, we'll see and we'll ask the questions like, great, after 2014, how many developers are going to be using Mantle, right? That's that's the real question that will determine if that turns out to be a, a long-term play or not. Moving onward to the storage world, Western Digital has come out with the MyCloud EX2. Alan, Val Al <laughs> Alan Malvantano, who apparently I only want to refer to as Malvantano or uh Basically wrote it up for PCPro.com, did the full review, gave it an editor's choice. It's an interesting box, right? So Western Digital came out with the MyCloud, which is their network-connected version of the MyBook, which is their external storage line of, of hardware. They came out with the EX4, which was a quad drive, uh, essentially a RAID box uh, in the MyCloud series. And now they have come out with the um, MyCloud EX2, which is a dual drive box. And it's a pretty simple situation. It's clean sophisticated looking um, user interface. Um, it is a simple box to configure. It's containing a pair of red drives. Um, if you buy it uh, populated, I think you can only buy it populated. Um, one of the things that Western Digital is pointing out is that, hey, we're all starting to store a lot of stuff, especially if you're unhinged with photos or unhinged with music or if you have a huge video collection. And, you know, there's a really great graph on one of the opening pages. There's the actually really easy to open up, uh, you know, drive bays inside of there. So you can basically set it up in a mirror configuration. If you're smart, if one drive dies, you still have the other drive full of data. Um, you know, but it's funny when you look at this this shift to multi-bay uh uh, the shift to multi-bay storage has started, right? They're looking at like by 2015, you know, a huge number of users having two, four, five, or six bay uh, NAS devices in their home. Like we just did another NAS, uh, free NAS build on Die Trine, which is really great because we had one of the uh, original developers, one of the co-founders of FreeBSD, one of the sort of uh, gatekeepers on the free NAS project. And it's amazing to start learning about how sophisticated data management is getting. The plugins are incredible. And one of the things that uh, Western Digital is doing here is trying to create a super simple way for you to have your data to back it up safely and to have it available on site, or excuse me, off site, and then to be able to copy that data to a third party service. Um, Alan liked it quite a bit, actually, um, which was yeah, nice I, to see. I, I'm I'm really intrigued by the idea of the personal cloud, like the the <laughs> idea of the same functionality right. that you get with Dropbox, but where you control the data. There's limitations to it, right? Like potential bandwidth limitations. You're limited by your own upstream bandwidth. Well, I mean, this is something my Pogo plug was playing around with this years ago with a, you know, mm -hmm. with a USB drive add-on, with a USB drive with it built in. It would connect to your yeah. network. Um, you know, I, I, you know, you just named it right there. One of the primary issues is that most of us don't have a lot of up load bandwidth or, or upstream yeah. bandwidth going from the house out. That's why it takes several years, it seems, to back up, you know, your big ass hard drive to, you know, to any of the cloud yep. stored services. <laughs> to use highly to sophisticated use technical, technical term. terms. Yeah. 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 Um, <laughs> <laughs> we're going to call that a big ass hard drive. Uh, 
you know, and, and the, but it's funny, right? Cause you look at uh crash plans, Epic, right? But if you have three terabytes or five terabytes or 12 terabytes of data, it's going to take halfway to forever. And of course, if you're somebody that's struggling with a data cap, hello, Australia, um, you know, you could blow through your data cap because your data cap is usually measured, not just on, on downstream bandwidth, but on upstream bandwidth, your ISP also. Um, right. That said, you could also take a couple of boxes, put them in the same room, you know, and, and replicate on your local network then transport that box to its new home. I am getting ahead of myself. Uh, I don't think that's an option. It's currently available in the MyCloud software. What you do have, you know, and one of the nice things is somebody who loves to build PCs to do everything around the house. Um, what you do have with a lot of the, the network attached uh, storage appliances like this is, you know, they are silent or near to silent. They consume almost no power, um, you know, Malvin Tano basically in the testing said the network throughput was excellent. Uh, quote, on the downside, relatively low write speeds to externally connected USB devices. So basically external USB storage, not so hot. Uh, XFAT not supported on USB devices, which means it's going to be complicated to use thumb drives to transfer stuff. 200 bucks for uh, zero terabytes or a disk list. You configure it yourself. Two terabyte, uh, two two terabyte uh, reds is three seventy, uh, and it tops out at uh, two four terabyte reds at five hundred seventy dollars. Um, you know, redundancy is critical. A single drive, uh, well, you know what? Well, let's not go into three two one right now because I think we've probably beaten that to death in the last month. But <laughs> sure, I mean, but it, it's worth noting that like. The, there was a MyCloud that's just a single drive, and we right. liked the software implementation, and we, we we liked how you know you could use it to share stuff with family members that maybe were less computer literate than you would like. But it was still only one drive, which to me didn't really like that. Two is one. Having, one is none. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Right. So I mean, at least having a RAID one array inside of it makes us, in my opinion, a much more usable device and it's something that I could see recommending to you know people like my sister and and brother-in-law that that have a lot of data they don't they don't know understand the complexities of Dropbox but if I could say hey plug this into your network plug this into your computer and you can just copy things to it and then you've got a mobile phone app it might work so uh, it's I it, it's really interesting and it's you know it's part of the push Western digital is doing a great job of turning from what everybody knew them as a hard drive manufacturer into like a services and product vendor. And I, I got to say, they've made a couple of great set top boxes along the way, which is something, yeah, they did. Uh, you know, and, and, and I got to give them credit. They've done a fantastic job. You know, there's, there's a lot of people who, who have slapped their name on sort of a pre-configured piece of hardware with the crappy sort of, you know, this is the software, the people that built the chips inside the Hoff soft, you know, it, there's there's like there's this sort of software that's developed by engineers in a hurry who are actually hardware engineers working on a chip, but they build just enough software to make it run. And some companies ship their products after, you know, they wrap it in the case and a power supply and they put storage on it. And then they put this crappy software that came from the chip manufacturer. Western Digital hasn't done that. Western Digital has done some stuff to, to deliver better performance, um, you know, a more robust features. I'm actually really excited with what Western Digital has been doing with their software interface. They're paying attention. They're paying attention to making life easier for the people who are asking us questions uh, at PC Per and Techzilla. And that makes our lives easier. Uh, and you know what? They make nice hard drives too. Go yeah. Western Digital. <laughs> Dude, what's up with the socketed Kabini APU, aka AMD's AM1 platform? Should I be excited? I mean, we all know that it's uh, not going to be faster than a Core i7. <laughs> uh, no, very much not so. Um, <laughs> I'm sorry. Was it's that, that a... wasn't meant to be mean? So actually, we saw this at CES, and I didn't really know right. what it was at the time. Um, I saw a motherboard at MSI's booth, I think at Gigabyte's booth, that were an AMD socket, clearly an mm -hmm. AMD socket uh, for Kabini, but AMD hadn't really made any official announcements about it. Now they have. Um, and this is essentially the competition to Bay Trail for small form factor systems, not tablets necessarily, but something more like in the 25 watt total system draw design, right? So um, AMD is very much targeting this as a uh, uh, emerging markets 
type mm -hmm. thing. You can see in that image there, they're looking at India, uh, South America, Central America, uh, and Europe as well, certain parts of Europe. Um, and, and that's kind of where it's going to launch first, and then it will progress into North America sometime later in the year as well. Um, this is a socketed version of Kabini, which is their kind of low power APU. Kabini is the larger version. Tamash is the smaller version. Um, you have up to four Jaguar x86 cores. You've got a GCN graphics core next architecture, uh, you know, SATA 6 support, SATA 6G support, USB 3 support, HDMI. All, all, there's a lot of great features in this. Um, and it's, we're talking like, AMD expects the top end combo to come in around $60. So that's motherboard and SOC in one, throw in memory and storage, and you have a system right there. And then obviously a case or whatever enclosure you want to use. Uh, and that's pretty compelling. We actually, uh, I don't have any of the uh, of these in yet, but I did get a Bay Rail motherboard. And obviously those are soldered onto the board. They're not socketed. And that's kind of like the main uh use case differentiator between these two platforms, right? So AMD is presenting a socket. That means you'll uh, you'll have external coolers. Uh, it also means that you have the potential for upgrade down the road. The question will be obviously, what options will you have to upgrade to down the road? Will they really be worth it? Will they be uh, significant upgrades? Will people that are buying a $60 motherboard and processor combo care about upgrading their processor as opposed to just buying another $60 motherboard CPU combo in two years or we're a year from now, that type of thing. Um, and it's a really interesting discussion though. Uh, it, it, it's, it's a cool, it's a neat thing. Like, um, you know, like the Bay Trail platform that we have in here, we like we're running some benchmarks on it, but I know that it's not going to be good. Like I know what, I know how it's going to perform, uh, but it's more of what can I do with this mini ITX motherboard that draws 10 watts at idle or something like that, uh, that I can't do with even a mini ITX, you know, core i5 or core i3 system, right? What, what kind of cool things can we do? Can we hook up a discrete graphics card? Does that make sense? Does it even work? Um, there's a whole lot of questions that will come along with all of this as well. So, um, this, this was like the official AMD announcement. If you go all over the web at, at, at pcper.com, we also have, you know, I think you'll see the announcements from Asus and MSI and Gigabyte and Biostar all announcing their AM1 specific motherboards. So you can kind of go through there and look at what kind of features they offer. And they have a surprisingly high amount of features for the price that you're paying for the platform. It's interesting. It is interesting. We uh, had some more news from AMD that they've launched another graphics card, the Radeon R9 280. Let me guess. Performance is somewhere between the 270 and the 290. And if we're very lucky, the current crash in Bitcoins uh, will allow us to actually buy one sometime before we're dead. That would be nice, <laughs> wouldn't it? That would be nice. Um, the, let's see, how do we do this? The R9 280 is basically the HD 7950 boost, which if you go back to that picture, I was kind of a smart ass. They didn't send out samples or anything. Uh, so I took a 7950 off my shelf and I put a piece of gaff tape on it and right. with a silver Sharpie rebranded it for them. <laughs> um, because that's effectively what it is. It's, it's like right. an eight megahertz, right? Single digit, eight megahertz increase in clock speed um, from this to the, the GPU you get now. Uh, How much is it supposed to be selling for? It's, it's su supposed to be 279 Okay. Um, which is $20 less than what the 280X is supposed to be selling for. 280X is supposed to be $299. Uh, you'll be hard-pressed to find it for $399. Yeah, it's today. the two, 280X is selling for $430 to $498 on Amazon right now. Yeah. There, there was an interesting Maybe. line, right? So they, they sent us a presentation. They sent us a press release. They didn't do a whole lot of thing, you know, build up for it because it's a very, right. it's a GPU we know very well. If you look at the quoted line from it, um, they say, following the exceptional demand for the entire R9 series, we believe the introduction of the R9 280 will help ensure that every gamer who plans to purchase an R9 series graphics card has an opportunity to do so. And I just don't understand the logic because 
the GPU in this part is the same GPU that exists in the 270X, in the 270, in the 265, and in the 280X, right? This is, it's the same right. silicon, just with, it has fewer <laughs> shader processors in the 280X, and it has more than the 270X, the 270, and 265. I'm sorry, it's the same, it's only the same GPU as the 280X, right? So, right. the... But it's got a lot more shader cores than the 270X. <laughs> it does. I don't think, I don't know how, unless they have this huge, unless they have this huge collection of pieces of silicon in the R9 280 that they could get to run at 7950 speeds, but they could not get to run at 7970 speeds. And they're going to flood the market with these R9 280s. I don't think it's going to drastically affect or change anything. I think it's just another part that will have the same result as long as the coin miners are still wanting to buy these cards. Um, right. And that's obviously what needs to change for any of this to change. The only two things will fix the problem for AMD. A lot more inventory right? Uh, or a decline in the people that want it, supply or demand. This is... I took I took a class in college and I think they used those words once. So... Are we talking about economics here? <laughs> oh God, I hope not. My mind exploded. <laughs> well let's see let's let's double check on amazon in, in our weekly check on can we yeah. buy amd graphics cards again and the answer is well they're starting at our 290s are starting at 520 dollars um also helps if you spell radeon without a w yeah I'm if saying. you're searching on Amazon, Amazon has probably the worst search of uh, all of them, and it makes it very difficult. <laughs> no, this, so this sometimes, was you can, sometimes you can find less expensive ones, but they are... Arna, um, wow. So R9, 290s, 500, 290X. No, there's another 290 for 600, 298. No, 290 for 5. This is up on... Wow, man, these are expensive, dude. Um. <laughs> you know, and, and it's interesting. Like the, the, the next, the next story we're going to talk about here. Actually, I actually asked the question. This was during a twenty-four a single twenty-four hour period. Um, mm -hmm. If the worst was behind us, because there was a Radeon R nine two ninety X on Newegg selling for five hundred forty nine dollars, which is the SEP or MSRP or whatever you want to call it. SEP mm -hmm. stands for suggested e-tail pricing. Right. Um, right. And so I was like, hey, that's really good. It lasted a whole day up there. Uh, today, the lowest priced is $589. And that power color is back up to $599. So you're within $40, but that's for the reference cooler. Right. Um, and, and I really don't like the reference cooler still. I still would highly recommend people not buy that version and look for like a gigabyte or an asus or an xfx that has a custom design um but the fact that it was even there compared to what we had two weeks ago where they were 899 mm -hmm. for like multiple days um okay that's that's uh that's, that's definitely moving in the right direction yeah and i don't know <laughs> what's interesting is i don't know if that means supply is increasing demand is decreasing or if there's somebody uh, particularly AMD, kind of massaging the system a little, saying we're getting a whole lot of negative press for this. We'd really appreciate it if you didn't gouge the customers that are trying to buy these cards, right? And it's <laughs> very it. possible. That that it. Be yeah. Well, it's. I mean, it's funny, right? Because it's. It's also going to be interesting because there's a huge. Uh, I want to say Newsweek story that broke this morning, where. Um, uh, the the Newsweek claims they found the individual behind Bitcoin, the 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 architect uh, of the Bitcoin system. You know, hours like he also apparently has been painted as he's somebody with sort of like a a history of doing secret things for big government, and big companies, and now you know a few hours later in a two hour interview with the Associated Press, he denies having anything to do with it. Um, uh, so, you know, but I bring that up because it's one of the things like, well, now that there's another huge Bitcoin story, uh, I wonder if that will reignite some level of interest or curiosity with Bitcoin mining for a bunch of 
way late to the party people who think they're going to get rich. Um, <laughs> mm, yeah, that could be dumb. Yeah. Um, you know, it doesn't always happen that way, but uh, it's kind of funny. Well, it's not funny at all, but it does. It's kind of irritating. But I like the idea that, 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 you know, rampant GPU speculation is probably on the wane and not on the rise. Uh, it's kind of funny to think of passively cooled motherboards as being a big deal, but let's talk about the Asus uh, J1800iC Bay Trail motherboard, which, if I'm not mistaken, is freaking tiny. Uh, yep. It and this cute. is one of several Bay Trail boards that was announced. I don't have the one I had out here last night with me, uh, but I actually have the Gigabyte one. And it's passively cooled, just like this one is. It has HDMI, it has USB 3, it has uh, a PCIe by one connection. Although, uh, spoiler alert, we cannot <laughs> reliably get a graphics card to run in the PCI Express by one slot, um, mm. even using one of those adapters that uh, the Bitcoin miners use to convert 1x slots to hold a graphics card. I was I was just curious to see if I could get it to work, but I think the, the BIOS itself is having trouble handling um, implementation of that. So, would that be uh, a firmware but it's, issue? Or something a firmware would update would resolve? It possibly could. I just don't know if they care enough to update it. Because Ouch. the number of people that are trying to install a, a graphics card, a discrete graphics card on a Bay Trail platform <laughs> is approaching zero. Yeah, you'll, you'll have to excuse me. I forgot that what we're basically talking about here is a, you know, like a, a inexpensive, low cost, low power Celeron part that is soldered to the motherboard. Um, I mean, this is this is the same thing that you'll find in like very inexpensive tablets, right? Mm -hmm. Like Intel Bay Trail tablets. This is essentially the same processor at work so it's it's not supposed to be used for that it was more of a, a an exercise in can we do this or not and it turns out we couldn't um uh other interesting little things about these platforms that it does use ddr3l so dim memory so you're looking at notebook style so dim modules and ddr3l they have to be low low power uh low voltage uh, if you try to put regular in there, it won't post. It won't work. Uh, same thing as like the Intel Nook devices. You've got USB 2, USB 3. You've got a COM port, gigabit Ethernet, uh, audio outputs, and HDMI and VGA as well. So it, this is one of those things where I'm not quite sure what we're going to do with it yet, but I think whatever we will end up doing will be interesting. You know, it's like, good. do we glue this to the wall and attach a TV to it? Do we... Uh, and maybe attach it to the back of the TV. <laughs> okay, glue it to the TV. That's fine too. We'll do that. I mean, what are we what are we talking about oh, as the price for this again? Um, this one, it looks like they're saying retail for sixty five dollars. That's, I mean, you know, it's funny. I've actually it's, seen it, I've actually seen the Gigabyte one for sale for seventy four. I think so, somewhere in that range. So it's not I mean, dirt cheap, but it's fairly cheap. It's fairly cheap. You know, it's 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 in it could you know will you be able to do 1080p blu-ray playback can you run it as a plex machine you know will it allow you to do a whole bunch of interesting stuff on your set top box because it's funny right because if you look at the uh if you look at the uh the next story we've got in the raspberry pi foundation is offering a ten thousand dollar reward to get quake 3 running on the raspberry pi which you want to talk about a low power accomplishment um <laughs> somebody just dropped in pizza thank you andrews there was a pizza fairy in the building, um, you know, but it's kind of funny, right? So you're talking about like a, you know, a $30 uh, computer, right? It's a board. It's a computer. The Broadcom BCM2835 system on a chip, which is based on an ARM architecture. And it is super low power. It is super simple. Um, and it's got some basic 3D graphics, some great uh, decoding for unpacking media. Uh, but the video core for 3D graphics processor, quote, relies upon a closed source driver because until yesterday, Broadcom had not provided documentation or code. Um they released a code that's technically for a different system on a chip, but both, quote, Broadcom on the Raspberry Pi Foundation believe the tools are there to port it over. Scott wrote this up for PC Per. And so the foundation, which has been 
all along is because when, when when the when the Raspberry Pi was released, they sold a hundred thousand boards on the first day, right? That's a fair amount of scratch for what's essentially an educational project or an open source project. Uh, and now they want to see if they can get Quake Three running on the Pi with open source drivers, which I think is really really awesome. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I, I, I get excited. There's a really cool, it's like the, the blog post on uh, raspberrypi.org is a birthday present from Broadcom. One, I can't believe it's been two years since the Raspberry Pi Model B went on sale. Two and a wow. half million Raspberry Pis have found homes with hobbyist children and professional engineers around the world. Um, the success of the Pi has allowed us to make substantial financial contributions to a range of open source projects, XBMC, uh, LibAV, PyPy, Pixman, Wayland West, and Squeak Scratch, the WebKit, and they're continuing to sponsor projects. But, quote, it's always felt like we had a piece of unfinished business. Um, I think it's really cool. Um, I think it's really excited. I think it's going to be really interesting to see uh, what shows up and what this means in terms of multimedia performance. Uh, for the Raspberry Pi boards. Um, a $28 computer that can play Quake. How cool is that? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's neat stuff. What would we have done for that when Quake 3 was actually fresh on the box and <laughs> yeah. costing $50? Who says technology hasn't improved? Oh, my goodness. Speaking sure. of technology improving, Chromebook 2s. Samsung's launching 11 and 13 inch Chromebook 2s. Are you excited? Are you going to hand over your Lenovo ThinkPad, move your life into a cloud environment? Get your Chrome no. on? <laughs> no, but you know what I do I do feel guilty about is never spending time with a Chromebook. That's because no one wants to give them away for testing or loan them out for testing. So we end up having to spend money on them to buy them ourselves. And suddenly yeah. $320 seems like something I could pay two months or three months with my electrical bill with. Correct. Um, it's an interesting market. You know, they, they seem to be selling them. They seem to be selling them in volume and people seem to be really happy yeah. with them. Um, They're like, um, I think uh, it was Ken that linked me to the the number one selling laptop on Amazon is a uh, $279 Chromebook, I think. Yeah. Well, it's interesting. Yeah, I mean, it's interesting to look at that because you have to wonder. $199. You know, Sorry. Yeah, I mean, it, it, and that's because it's, it's so inexpensive and because there are so many different models of laptops. Um, you know, that was that was really funny. Like, there used to be like, you know, Apple sells has the largest individual selling laptop line in America. And it's like, well, you you have three laptops at the particular time. They had like three or four laptops. So <laughs> right. <laughs> compared to, say, Dell, who had like 300 variations on, on their particular theme. Um, the specs are looking good, right? You know, 13.3 inch model is uh, 0.65 inches thin, weighs 3.09 pounds. 1366 by 768 on the 11.6, uh, full 1080p on the 13.3 inch Chromebook. 11.6 um, weighs two and a half pounds, which is pretty awesome in terms of weighing nothing. Um, Exynos 5 Octus system on a chip running at either 1.9 gigahertz or 2.1 gigahertz, four gigs of DDR3L and 16 gigs of internal SSD storage. Finally, they're packing a little storage inside of these things, a whole 16 gigabytes. They're claiming uh, eight hours of battery life for the 11.6 inch Chromebook, eight and a half hours for the 13.3 inch Chromebook. Um, and of course, this is this is meant for you to be running your life on the Google in the Google Docs and living. What do you Google What do you lifestyle. think about? I mean, this is this is powered by a Samsung processor, not a intel part not an x86 part uh, right. we had this discussion last night and I, my kind of decision was well if you're using it as the system was intended to be used as a chromebook you're not trying to put linux on it right. you're not trying to put windows on it then it probably won't matter right because the operating system is entirely built along a browser that is obviously working fine on the soc um but it's also kind i kind of think it's kind of expensive for what it is like the um well, it's it's most, three ninety nine for the higher end model, the thirteen inch with the ten AP screen. Right, you know that's twice as much as that Acer C seven twenty or whatever. Um, and, and so I'm I'm curious <laughs> if that's going to kind of put it outside the realm, right? It, it, when you buy a hundred ninety nine dollar notebook, right, I feel like you're going to have much lower expectations as what as, as to what it will be able to do. 
Well, and that, that three hundred ninety nine dollars. <laughs> that that may also be you know it's kind of an issue. Is it going to be an upsell? Um, you know, at the point of purchase, is it something where people are going to be looking at benchmarks on this? Are they going to think like, goodness, um, you know, this looks so much better uh, than the 11 inch Chromebook? I I don't know. You know, for most people. Most people, when they go shopping, whether it's an HDTV or a new PC or a Chromebook, they probably don't have a really accurate idea unless they've, they've done their homework, right? They walk into the store and they're like, oh, there's a laptop for $300. Hey, honey, I can get a laptop for $300. Well, it's a Chromebook. What's a Chromebook? Hey, you know, Bobby uses Chrome on his computer at school. You know, um, I, I, I'm kind of curious, right? Uh, to see what the it would be, you know, it would be interesting to find out what people are doing with these and, and, and how many people are just like, it's a homework machine. It's a machine right. where I don't have to worry about my mom downloading something and wiping out her system. Um, uh, you know, I, 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 I'm going to, I'm going to say this, you know, this may sound a little crazy, but Samsung probably wouldn't be building these models if they didn't think they wouldn't sell all of them. I could be wrong, but, um, <laughs> you know, we'll see. Yeah. I mean, we're also looking at the, you know, these like 11.6 inch, $300 laptops, um, mm -hmm. from places like Dell, we're also looking like I, I got one of the Dell Venue eights in, and I'm like, I'm looking at Windows on an eight inch tablet and going, wow, wonder if I can try to get all of my work done for a week on this. Um, you know, I won't be able to do some product testing with it, but most of the rest of the stuff on there uh, uh, will work. But it, it's interesting, you know. It's a time when the whole computer universe is in flux and evolution, and we're just going to see some amazing stuff. I mean, just wait till your entire life is running on your Samsung watch. Oh, it's already there, man. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Uh, we got an email from Matt. Actually, we should, one, thank everybody for listening. And two, uh, remind you that if you want to email us, it's twitch, T-W-I-C-H at twit.tv. And if you're new to the show and you're enjoying the Ryan and Patrick experience, which we'd like to underplay because we want you to be sort of overwhelmed with how glorious this is, uh, and if you want to tell us, twitch, twit.tv. But we don't want to set expectations too high. We don't want to polish our own apple here. This has been a request from Ryan, who, by the way, looks splendiferous in those glasses. Um, uh, we love your... that picture down. <laughs> no, but it's... Then there's the horse head picture. There it is. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, we also love your email questions. Uh, and they, they serve to kind of guide us for what we're looking for. Matt says, with the upcoming birth of our first child, I'm looking to greatly down... down let me try this again, Matt. With right. the upcoming birth of our first child, I'm looking at greatly downsizing all the tech stuff I've collected over the past um many years to save some space. But that has left me with some issues I'm hoping you can help me out with. One, where the heck is a good place for me to sell some of this stuff? Most of it is no more than three years old, and all of it is in great working condition. I'm talking about a 2011 iMac, video cards, a few monitors and laptops, etc., Two, do you guys have any recommended baby tech that you or folks you know cannot live without? Three, I've got a Sandy Bridge main gear full tower desktop that I recently rebuilt with an SSD and added an R7950 for video editing. And that got me to thinking, there has to be a smaller form factor way to make video editing machines. So I would like to propose a challenge to Ryan, make the smallest form factor box for video editing that can be had for under $2,000. Dun, dun, dun. So um, there are lots of places to sell electronics online. Um, there are places that specialize in buying or used electronics uh, like uh, Gazelle. There are, you know, for example, if you had a Sprint phone, you could probably take advantage of some of the stuff Ting is doing. You can sell it on Craigslist. Uh, I'm not a huge fan of selling electronics on eBay, um, but that has more to do with my experiences on eBay, uh, not so much what the average eBay user's experience is. Um, you know, Nextworth, Gazelle, YouSell.com, Biomitronics, uh, Amazon.com, Electronics, Trade In. Uh, you know, there's there's a whole bunch out there, uh, or there are a whole bunch of sites out there dedicated to it. Gazelle seems to be working really well for a lot of people. I've sold a lot of stuff on Craigslist over the year, but I'm in Bay Area, in the Bay Area of California, which is probably the highest concentration of of Craigslist users in the planet. So that makes you know, there's a fairly large market there. Um, you know, a lot of people are really liking Amazon trade-in. Best Buy now has a trade-in uh, uh, program. You know, and what you want to do is kind of see if you can figure out what people are getting for the items on eBay, what they're getting on your local Craigslist, if there's a decent amount of people using Craigslist, and kind of figure out what it's worth to you. Because one of the nice things about sending it to somebody like Gazelle or Amazon trade-in or something is that you don't have to answer 72 email questions. 
You know what I mean? Where the guy's like, well, you know, it looks like there might be a scratch on the case. We take $8 off for the scratch. And the the letter A on the keyboard is a little worn. I think you should take off another $12 for that. Um, but I'm just saying. But, you know, you can search around online. Craigslist is always an option. Uh, you know, if it's anything that's worth any kind of money, use an escrow program on eBay. Uh, at least I would. But I'm paranoid. And that's just me. Um, baby tech... Is mostly overrated. <laughs> what my wife and I affectionately refer to as the baby industrial complex, uh, not to be confused with the wedding industrial complex, complex or the, the military industrial complex, is trying to convince you that you need thousands of pieces of weird-ass crap scattered around your home to protect the baby. You're not a good parent if you don't protect the baby at all times. Clearly. That said, um, you know, as somebody who would lean over the... Because... Like, you know, my son was basically, well, he's still basically in motion 24 hours a day. And when he would go into a deep sleep, you'd be like, oh, the baby's dead. And you, you would sort of lean over or look for the lungs or, yeah. you know. Um, you know, so I understand why some of the baby monitors are out there. Uh, a lot of people like baby monitors. A lot of baby monitors are overpriced crap. Um, I mean, because it's funny, like when you see a camera you can buy for like, you know, 50 bucks on eBay as part of a $270 sophisticated baby monitoring system, um, you know, <laughs> I, I, I find it's a little frustrating because there's just a lot of crap shoveled at parents and it pisses me off. Um, you know, I would, you know, the other thing is, is the models, the models don't change too often. We did a couple segments on this on, on Texel a while back and I'll see if I can find a link. We can put them in the show notes, but, um, you know, with baby video monitors, I would probably just buy a drop cam and, and make my own, or I would skip having it. When we had our first child, we were in a 700 square foot apartment. And if the baby was awake, we knew it because <laughs> um, <laughs> there was nowhere to run to and nowhere to hide. Um, you know, Motorola, Motorola has sort of a decent, inexpensive $100, $150 uh, camera. Um, there's one I'm trying to find on the Amazon. And, uh, uh, and I'm sure somebody in the chat room is writing about that crazy strap the boot onto the baby 24-hour heart rate monitor, which I'm not a big fan of. There it is, Infant Optics. The Infant Optics DXR5 2.4 gigahertz digital baby monitor with night vision. So you can the get the baby that has night vision? No, sadly, this is not an upgrade for your child to <laughs> your child night vision, <laughs> uh, which would be really awesome, Ryan. And I'm looking forward to you having your first child so I can watch you try to give your child night vision. Um, <laughs> Heroes reborn, man. Ryan's child is going to have night vision. You should talk to your wife before you do that. Um, yeah. You know, she is the medical professional in the family. Um, that, But like Infant Optics uh, DXR5 is one of the ones that seems to be really, really popular. It's wireless. It's got a little camera that goes in the baby's room. It's got a little wireless monitor that you carry around with you around the house so you can sort of get your baby stalking on. Uh, a lot of people really like VTech Communications. They do audio monitors. And essentially, if the kid's also room baby is far blue. Enough, Also baby blue. It is a lovely baby blue. Um you know, and then there's uh, VTech does a pretty good job um, with the audio monitors. And then there's just like crazy. Oh, there it is. The insanely expensive. It's not insanely expensive. It's 240 bucks. Uh, the Motorola MBP36 remote wireless video baby monitor with 3.5 inch color LCD screen, infrared night vision, remote camera pan, tilt and zoom, um, which is like $240. Um, you know, I, I'll, I'll be honest with you. There's. There's a very short phase in the kids. I, like, unless you have the giant house, uh, you know, or or you, you, if you have a giant house or if you want to be able to sort of like monitor the baby while you're watching television at the far end of the giant house, I think in most cases, a lot of this stuff is not particularly necessary. It can be nice. Um, I may be more of a sort of like, you know, let the child figure out things for themselves or or maybe I'm putting everybody to sleep by spending way too long answering this question. But the baby monitors are nice. Um, you know, so is putting a video camera connecting you to a standard web camera will work. I've seen people put laptops in the baby's room, which is nice because you can use the laptop to play music and stuff like that and take advantage of the camera and the laptop. Um, mostly, though, uh, baby wipes. 
baby wipes, sleep as much as you can before the kid is born. The first eight weeks are a nightmare. Meconium, read up on it before it shows up and scares the hell out of you. Um, wow. <laughs> Meconium is yeah. a big warning. Um, and uh, have fun. You know, it's going to be eight to 12 weeks of pure sleep deprived insanity unless you have one of those strange kids that sleeps through the night. If you do, I'm very happy for you. Don't tell me about it. Um, and, uh, you know, don't buy any freaking $1,500 strollers or $300 freaking, you know, high chairs because you're only going to use them for a very short period of time. You're going to feel really silly thinking you could have spent that money on computer tech, golf bags or clubs or trips or vacations and, uh, or on a sitter to take care of the child while you go out and make sure you still have a relationship with your wife. <laughs> nice. Anyhow, nice. Um, as far as the Sandy Bridge main gear full tower desktop, uh, you know, it's amazing what you can do these days with, uh, you know, either going to a, a mini ITX board, going to a smaller case. And there's actually some decent devices that will allow you to sort of rotate your GPU at a 90 degree angle to the motherboard so you can flatten out a full power motherboard and GPU. You can get a really small form factor box kicking ass on video editing. And yeah, the screen I mean, just started again. <laughs> right. Uh, what, what, like, especially if you get like a case like the Corsair 250D yeah. that uses a mini ITX motherboard, has one discrete, and mini ITX motherboards will have one discrete uh, PCI Express graphics slot. Right. Other than that, I mean, you have room for two full size hard drives, two SSDs, uh, water cooling. Um, you can put a 4770K with a Z87 motherboard in there, right? You can get almost, this, I'm, I'm going to guess, the same amount of computing power that he has in that one desktop machine into right. a mini ITX design, right? And you can even get smaller than that if you go with like the EVGA uh, Hadron Air or something like that, just a little bit harder to work in. Um, mm -hmm. But it's, I mean, it's definitely possible to do that. And you can do that for well, well under $2,000, Um I just looked at the at, at our leaderboard. Uh, if you look at the high end system, um, you know it's obviously built with a full size ATX right. motherboard in mind. Add, you know, you can probably get a, a mini ITX board for fifty bucks less than the board we have in there. You can get a video card. Uh, you can keep using the seventy nine fifty that he's got now, um, and SSD that he's got now, and you can really, you could probably move from that desktop system to a mini ITX system for 500 bucks or something mm -hmm. like that would be a guess. Um, you know, because I think that case even will take a regular size ATX power supply. So if that case he has has a regular size ATX power supply, he could even, uh, in theory, salvage that out of there too. So I, I, I don't, you know, if he's looking to build a whole new system, you can probably do it for $1,300, $1,400 out the door, right, and have plenty of power, or you can go way less than that if you're willing to take parts out of your current system and, and put it in new chassis and get a new motherboard, maybe a new processor. Yeah, the uh, <laughs> Web5720. What about a new Mac Pro if you have the money? No. Uh, it's a beautiful, elegant, yeah, sophisticated, wondrous, magnificent piece of, of style and engineering or stylish engineering. Um, but, you know, most of the people I know who edit have walked away from Final Cut Pro, which means they no longer have to be tied to OS 10 and overpriced desktop hardware. Um, you know, and as somebody who lives on OS 10, you know, uh, it's, you know, if you're going to do high-end video editing, do it on Premiere. If you're going to do low-end video editing, there's some cool stuff going on with, with Final Cut now. But I would avoid, if I, if I wanted to just do video editing, I would feel absolutely no compulsion to go with a Mac Pro. It is very small, and it is a magnificent piece of engineering. I, I, I mm -hmm. will grant it that. It's pretty. It's really cool. Um, and I hope the... You know, some of the, the minor reports out there of overheating are completely overstated or because people are doing silly things like mining Bitcoining. Uh, Chief Godzilla, no, I am not a Texan, uh, but my family is mostly from Missouri and I occasionally say things like <laughs> y'all. Um, so <laughs> Mac Pro is a waste of money, says Y Guy. And the floodgates have opened in the chat room. Yeah, there you go. Bring um, it up. <laughs> See, versus Mac stuff. Yeah. I don't know if it's I don't know if it's overpriced. I think it's a mag I, I really do think it's a magnificent piece of engineering. Oh yeah, it clearly really is. Yeah. It's also kind of like a lot of cars that I would happily, you know, I got a chance to drive an Audi R8, took it in a heartbeat, 
ain't going to pay for, you know, $200,000 for Correct. one. Don't have the money to pay $200,000 for one. But if Correct. you want me to, if you want me to drive one, I'll drive it all day long. <laughs> it is yeah. cool that they are assembled in the USA. That's a pretty giant sack of awesome. Yeah. But then again, most uh, smaller manufacturers that make PCs assemble their PCs in the United States. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, With any like you know. the main gears and all that kind of yeah. stuff, they're all doing that here, obviously. Yeah. And the small manufacturers don't stash their billions offshore in Ireland. But that's a whole nother obnoxious conversation we don't need to get into. Um, be bad, Bob. If he recycles the old phone into a baby cam, he doesn't need to sell it then, which is a nice thought. Um, mm. And yeah, I, yeah, SSID GTX 750 Ti is absolutely a fantastic value right now. If you don't have a lot of money for a gaming machine, uh, but you want all the GPU you can get for the least amount of money. I, th I, I think that's pretty much the sweet spot between like $75 and $200 because um, the $75 cards aren't going to give you a whole lot. Uh, the $200 cards aren't giving you a whole lot more than the 750 Ti. Um, <laughs> so what's your favorite uh, ultralight laptop right now, Mr. Shroud? This is for Mick Butterpants. My favorite ultralight Laptop. Yeah, well, he's I, he's I, actually saying the the best MacBook Pro comparable laptop. I like the XPS thirteen. We just got one in for testing for okay. Miguel. Um, I haven't played with that yet. Um, um, see, because all of mine, all all of my preferences would be smaller than that, even like right. in the twelve to fourteen inch range. Uh, and again, I'm just such a big, I've been such a fan of the ThinkPad series. Uh, we just mm -hmm. got in the, the uh, ThinkPad Lenovo, uh, the Lenovo ThinkPad Yoga, mm -hmm. which is a ThinkPad that has the same, um, uh, you know, two-in-one convertible characteristics that uh, the right. regular Lenovo IdeaPad Yoga has. So you get the fold over and make it a tablet mode. You get the tent mode and all that kind of stuff, but you get the keyboard and input uh, and software and stuff of a ThinkPad, which is kind of interesting. You just don't have when it, you don't have room for an external battery that way. So that the internal battery is the only one you get. So we're still testing to see how uh, battery life on that one turns out. Yeah. It's going to be interesting. Like I just got the Dell XPS and so I'll let you know uh, mm. uh, how the, uh, Oh, another scream comes from the other room, <laughs> but that's a very they they obviously were thinking about the the MacBook uh, the MacBook Pro when they designed and engineered that. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Patrick, you come into the Detroit Autorama to enter your car for a chance at the Riddler trophies? No, there's uh, uh, the other the actual Riddler trophy quality car builders would have me beaten to death and thrown out in the nasty section of Detroit if I brought my ugly ass truck anywhere near their incredible <laughs> rides. Um, PC per fan, Sony Vio Pro 13 is 2.34 pounds, 13.3 inch. Um, <laughs> and yes, I believe there is a new yoga ThinkPad coming out right now. Uh, Master Meat says, I still love my MacBook Air with boot camp for Skyrim, which is pretty awesome. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. My wife, who was was never a Mac person, went out and bought a, a MacBook Air, and she's, other than the learning curve, right. is at least enjoying the hardware. It's um, a nice, it, it's nice it piece. Is. It is. It, it's funny to she. I mean, the notebook she's had, she'd had for a while, and I guess it didn't have two finger scrolling on the touchpad. It changes She didn't your have life. it enabled, and and <laughs> and like the 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 Safari browser doesn't have a scroll bar on the side by default. Mm -hmm. Right. right. And so she was looking at me and she's like, how do I scroll down this web page? <laughs> right. And I kind of leaned over and I flicked on the trackpad and she was like, oh, like immediately it was, you know, yeah, it was funny. Elegant, stylish, and simple. Yeah. <laughs> Superu says, I have an old 80 gigabyte SSD sitting on the shelf. The only SSD, whoops, uh, in the system, any advantage to making it a page file drive? Wait, he has an 80 gig sitting on the shelf. I assume he has another one in his system? Yes. Sorry, there's right? only SSD in the system. You know, it's just like reading, except I do it differently. Apparently, I'm going to make it up as I go along. Let me try that one more time. Subaru has an old 80. The other problem is, is that the chat room is leaping up. It every, scrolls, yes. Yeah, halfway through the read. Um, 
I have an old 80 gigabyte SSD sitting on the shelf, only SSD in the system. Uh, any advantage to making it a page file drive? Uh, and it's kind of funny. A lot of that depends on how much memory you have in the system because Windows, yeah. uh, Windows 7, Windows 8 started doing some really incredible things with caching, taking your unused system memory and storing your most awesome, most awesome, most often used file directly in system memory, which makes them incredibly fast to access. Um, you know, is there an advantage to, in theory, yes, there should be an advantage to putting your page file on an SSD because, hey, an SSD is faster than rotating media. Uh, in right. terms of real world performance, I think your mileage is going to vary. Yeah, um, I, yeah, I agree. I don't, uh, I don't know. I think unless you have four gigs of memory, memory in your system, the right. chances of you using your page file are pretty low nowadays. Um, if you have eight gigs, especially if you have something like 16, right. you know, you're not really ever going to use it. Like I, I had actually, I had this problem this week. I was running out of room on my SSD on my main system and, uh, I used Winderstat, one of my favorite applications to, uh, find out where all the data is being used on your system. And I had windows had automatically configured a 40 gigabyte page <laughs> file on right. my SSD. And I only have 16 gigs of Ram. Or, I, or not that I only have, but I have 16 gigs of RAM and I wasn't even close to using it. So I was just like, all right, well, we're not going to have a page file. I think I lowered it to like five gigs or something like that. Um, right. So uh, I I think they're used a lot less likely than most people would believe. Yeah, I mean, it's funny, like, you know, if you go to the the Adobe, the Photoshop help page, uh, you know, CS4, CS5, CS6, CC, uh, yeah. the dreaded CC, Um you know, it's funny. Photoshop reads and writes image information to the disk when there's not enough RAM to contain all of it. Check the efficiency indicator as described below to determine whether getting a faster hard disk or solid state disk would improve your performance. If the efficiency number is above 95%, spending money on a faster scratch disk has little benefit. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it's, you know, and then, of course, they say to get the greatest benefit from an SSD, use it as a scratch disk. Um you know, but that only works if you have images that don't fit entirely in RAM. And if you're running 8 to 16 gigabytes of RAM, you're probably working with some big-ass RAW files. You know? Yeah. So there's definitely situations where using it as your scratch disk will benefit you, um, but it's less likely to benefit you if you have, you know, 8 or 12 or 16 gigabytes of RAM. Um, yep, I agree. Yeah. Oh, my goodness. One last one before we go, McButterpants. Patrick, do you feel touch is necessary for PCs going forward or a fad? <laughs> um he asked oh. you not me i want to i want to yeah and also burke says patrick turn the camera around there's no one there he's screaming on the other side of that wall <laughs> nice <laughs> The, uh, yeah, I, you know, it's funny. I've, I'm working with two all-in-one desktops. Uh, I've been spending a lot of time with a Lenovo and a, and a Vizio. And then I've used several uh, laptops in the last uh, 18 months with uh, touchscreen displays. And the longer, you know, I the only time I find myself using the touchscreen display is when someone's over my shoulder and I'm making a picture bigger or I'm scrolling something. 98% of the time, and it's probably because I've, I've spent much of my adult life using a mouse uh, or a touchpad and a keyboard, but I just control my stuff normally. Um, in the rare moment when I am, you know, actually looking at the Metro interface in Windows 8, I might <laughs> poke something, but I'm more likely to actually do that with the mouse than I am to do it with the touchscreen. I think there's just, yeah, it's a good theory. It's a beautiful operating system. I think you're much more likely to use, you know, that interface properly uh if you're on a tablet right which is why windows 8.1 started suddenly you know moving in the direction of making windows 8 more like windows 7 um speaking of which by the way windows xp uh the countdown has started <laughs> again <laughs> i'm just I, saying i would that. say uh, the the last thing i would say on the, on the touch screen is i i don't i don't think it's a fad and I also don't think it's necessary. I think it will be eventually that the technology will just be in every device and it won't cause like it will be there if you need to use it. 
and you don't have to use it if you don't want to, if that's the form factor, right? I mean, there's there's enough convertible notebooks out there like that yoga stuff, like uh, the Dell flip screens, where having a touch interface on the screen is required in order for that whole convertible process to actually work. Um, yeah. So I, I just, you know, like I wouldn't care if my laptop here had a touch screen as long as everything else worked fine around it and it didn't make it, you know, noticeably thicker because of the touchscreen, which is still kind of the case with some machines. Um, so if it's just an option for me, great. If it's the only option, then that's bad. So, you know, that's, you know, kind of goes back to what you were saying. It's yeah, whatever is, is the best user scenario for that use case scenario. Yeah. It's, I mean, it's funny. I've, I've never seen anyone. I, 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 and, and, I haven't seen everyone. There's a lot more people out there using computers than I'm ever going to get to talk to. But I don't know <laughs> anybody who's like, you know, touch screen on my laptop has really changed my life. Um, yeah, I agree. Um, you know, they keep, you know, it, it, one of the things we saw from Intel a couple of years ago at CES is they're like, you know, your voice will change the way you interact with the computer. You'll be gesturing to your computer. You'll be doing happy dances with your computer. Your computer will, you know, and it's a great theory, but the reality is we act with react, we interact with information in certain ways and maybe the connect is changing that some ways and maybe, you know, built in webcam, there's change. It's, it's, there's a lot of theory, but mostly it comes down to Intel has incredibly powerful processors that can do much more work than you can actually throw at them. So let's figure out ways to complicate your relationship to the computer that makes it <laughs> more consumery consuming consu more clock cycles means bigger and faster intel processors right um i tease and i mock but the reality is is that there's a lot of elegance in the interaction between the computer and 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 people i i also will say google glass which is not particularly high end or sophisticated hardware it was is as somebody who spent 15 years trying to get a light to turn on or off. You know, I, there's this horrible experience I had uh, when I first started working in television, which is several years after I started working in magazines, testing products, you know, where it was like fresh gear lamp on. And of course it didn't turn on. And no matter what we did, it wouldn't work. And it was like that, that has been my, apparently my voice is the voice that does not work uh, with any sort of voice activated hardware or Siri, <laughs> Siri, you know, I talk to Siri just to make myself laugh once in a while. You know, my iPhone just looks at me and be like, yeah, we'll get you a 300-pound cheeseburger covered with grease. Like, no, it's not what I asked for. Just no, open up Google Maps. Um, you know, but, you know, I put the Google Glass on in front of mine, loaned me, and I asked it to do something, and it did it. It's like, okay, Glass. <gasps> Glass responded. You know, I asked it to locate something. It did. It came up on the screen. I asked it to do a few more things. It did each and every one of them. And I was just like, wow, I've never actually talked to a computer and not been embarrassed and frustrated by the end of the experience. So, you know, I think it's going to be happening. Uh, um, I, yeah, I think so too. You know, we'll see how it is. I, I posted the am I running xp.com in the chat room. Uh, just because I find the web page really, really amusing. Uh. <laughs> Alan showed us last night that you could just change your user agent on your uh, machine. So that, uh, uh, yeah, actually here, I think I can change mine as well. You can just say, it'll trick it into thinking you're running Windows XP if for some reason oh, you want funny. to do that. Yeah. At Knox Harrington, Ryan Shroud, I just love it when I'm using my iPad and MacBook Air at the same time and I start touching my MacBook screen and wondering why nothing is happening. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's true. I, I, I have done that before. I won't say that I won't, but it's right. not as frequent as, as it might be. So, Oh, my goodness. Yeah, it's going to be interesting. Ladies and gentlemen... We wait with bated breath to find out the fate of XP. I don't think Microsoft's going to abandon it, but I've been wrong about these things before. And certainly Microsoft is desperate to pry XP users off XP, <laughs> the one third of the Windows universe that is running on XP and get them into Windows 8. And I will say there will be performance advantages to, to working with Windows 8 because of the way, at least with, with you know, uh, memory handling and stuff like that. Windows 8's a fascinating piece of hardware. Whoops, software. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> In any case, Web 5720, that's the glass guy in India doing that, Patrick. No, no, there was no other people involved. Um, but, uh, 
Yeah. <laughs> What's coming up on PC Per this week since I seem to be stumbling off into contemplative hardware land, which I should stop before I put everyone to sleep. Um, uh, I, over the weekend, we're going to do a system build to prepare for Titanfall. We're going to build a low-cost system that will allow you to play it at uh, better image quality than you will get out of the Xbox One. It'll be more expensive than the Xbox One, but it'll be infinitely, maybe not infinitely, but it will definitely be better than the Xbox One. Uh, we also have, um, what do we have? We have a couple of GTX 780 Ti cards, and we have a retail R9 290 card as well to review. So we've got we've got some more GPU stuff coming up, and then we're going to do another kind of system build in preparation nice. for uh, a, the big PC launch of Titanfall next week. Sweet. We uh, had a really, 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 really fun time. Uh, one of the co-founders of BSD who works at IX Systems um, came up uh, from San Jose, from San Jose uh, with one of the uh, his co-workers at IX Systems. And we did another uh, Die Trying episode, this time with people who basically helped code and, and help teach people about uh, FreeNAS. So really, really, really cool FreeNAS conference. Uh, conservation confirmation but a, a discussion of actually sort of the origins of freebsd which is the underpinnings of os 10 um some of his experiences working at apple versus you know working in the freebsd community and then of course it is really super detailed uh freebsd built including some what i feel is more accurate uh, information uh about hardware choices um uh, and why you might want to go with ECC RAM and, and more high-end systems versus a low-end configuration out of sort of parts you have hiding around the house. Um, that was really, really fun. Um, and then uh, I've also got the uh, Dell XP in, uh, excuse me, Dell XPS 13.3 in, and we've got some interesting stuff going on uh, that we can't quite talk about yet on HD Nation, but there's some new Logitech Harmony remotes and new HD TVs are coming. Ooh. Yes. <laughs> yes, they are. I like me some 2014 HD TVs. Um, cool. Yeah. Also, I got to say, Crash Pan plug-in for free NAS. So awesome. Huh. So, All right. Now I also just got to figure out if I can buy a 750 Ti to build my Titanfall box before they all sell out. So exciting. Titanfall. You're going to like just stop communicating at home when Titanfall hits or are you over it? No, already? probably not. <laughs> I'll play it for a couple of days. You know what game I really want to play? Unfortunately, is I really want to play South Park. Um, <laughs> there's but that's a, new a game, South Park game. Yeah, there's a new South Park like RPG. Oh no! Uh, and it's just as crude as the uh, as the show. And I've seen some previews of it, and it just looks funny. I'm embarrassed to say that it's like this is this is actually what I want to play <laughs> over the weekend. We'll see if I can squeeze out any time for that. We'll we'll take a look. <laughs> Um, I, 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 I search for South Park video game and I get the new South Park video game is one giant, very disgusting, pretty okay episode of South Park. That's BuzzFeed. This is about killing much more than Kenny, says the New York Times. <laughs> <laughs> I just, I got to read both those articles just to know. Yeah, yeah. Ladies and gentlemen, twits, T W I C H at twit.tv is the email address. And if you're joining us for the first time, do us a favor, go to twit.tv slash twitch and you can get all of the episodes and learn how to subscribe to make sure you don't miss a single glorious episode. We love your email questions. We try to answer them when we can. Uh, and I promise no more 35 minute discussions of the glories of baby monitors, uh, <laughs> no matter how necessary they might be. <laughs> At Patrick Norton on Twitter and at Ryan Shroud on Twitter. We want to thank you all for listening and joining us each and every week. We want to thank the chat room for hanging in and torturing us. Um, you yeah. guys are awesome. I'm Patrick Norton. I'm Ryan Shroud. We'll see you next week on Twitch. <laughs>